yeah. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's open with a, a word of prayer. Lord, we we recognize from our lives and our life experiences, but more importantly, from your word, that we are constantly facing opposition. That there are those that seek to destroy your faith in our hearts, destroy even us, because they could not destroy your son. And so we pray, Lord, that the promises of your son, the promises of your word, the, the reassurances and the reinforcements that we shall one day be more than conquerors, that you continue to bring these to pass in our lives and that you build up our confidence and our faith as we see it in the word to know that you have us in your loving hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We are today in uh, chapter 13. It would be really easy to spend, I think, about three or three weeks just in this chapter. I think I, I feel like I better start going faster here. I've got I've to keep this moving along. We slow down too much. Um, so... Maybe by the grace of God we'll get we'll get halfway done and finish it next uh, next Sunday. But this is a this is an exciting chapter because this is the chapter that introduces us to the the beasts the beasts. Now, um, when you hear that kind of language about the beast, what kinds of things come to your mind from what you? heard or seen or read with the reference devil. to the the beast the evil. devil yeah evil <clears throat> the devil yeah that he's he's creates he wants us to worship the devil go just go down if you're on chapter 13 just go down to the last verse of the of the uh, chapter we, which we won't get to today, but this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for is the, it is the number of a man. His number is 666, right? E even people that don't know anything about Christianity in our culture know that there's something about this 666, right? They've all, everybody's heard that. So so some of this has, has crept into popular Culture. So we want to take a take a look at it today. Um, remember from the last time we met in chapter twelve that we were told about this great red dragon, and we were told specifically who the dragon is. Who is the the dragon? Satan. No. Who? Satan. Who's Satan? Right. The great, the great red dragon was Satan. And what we're learning here today in chapter 13 is that Satan, who now is, is trying to make war on all the all those that are the, the, the church is our mother, the, all, all those that are come from the woman, who's the church, right? Which is you and I. Satan is trying to make war on us and he's trying to destroy us. What we learn in chapter 13 is that he's doing that through two agents. He has he has two, you, you, I don't want to use the word person because that could be misleading, but for lack of a better word now, two, two, two people working for him. One is the beast that comes out of the sea, the other is the beast that comes from, from the earth. They are the ones that are acting on behalf of the dragon to bring the dragon's wrath and destruction into your life. So it becomes very helpful to, to see, get a, get a sense of who these folks are, right? Um, someone has also pointed out, I just it's interesting enough that I thought I'd mention it, that there, the, 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 that the Godhead exists in Trinity. Who are the three persons of the Godhead? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The um, the forces of evil 
also seem to have like a mock trinity. Now, ontologically, it's something very different, of course, but but the imagery is that it's it's imitating God. It's trying to to to, to be a, a a mirror image, except on the dark side, I guess you could call it, of God. And so there's this trinity of evil. The dragon, the beast from the sea, and the beast from the <clears throat> earth. And you can see aspects of these three that, like once again, mirror things that are in the aspects of the three persons of the trinity. So the, the dragon, he's trying to get us to to worship the dragon, but what else do we worship? Or what else do they want us to worship? They want us to worship the beast. So you'll see that as we get in there. Um, just as, as Christians, we worship God, the Father, and we also worship the Son. And then the Holy Spirit for us, what is the Holy Spirit's role or function in the, in the Trinity? What does the Holy Spirit do? Creates our faith, guides us. Um, the Holy Spirit's purpose is to draw us to Christ, to Jesus, right. Um, remember, the Holy Spirit does not talk about Himself. The Holy Spirit bears witness to Christ. He's always trying to direct us toward Christ. And you see that in this unholy trinity too. The, the third beast, the beast from the earth, what's his purpose? To create worship of the second person in the unholy trinity, the, the beast from, from the sea. So, so there's like this aping uh, of, of the, the true trinity. So we're going to take a look at the, the first beast today. So if we go to chapter 13, and... Um, <coughs> I'll start at verse 1. I guess it doesn't hurt to read this whole thing. I think that's what I'll do. So verses... How will I finish this today? There's no way. <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> All right, let's do verses 1 through 10. We'll read it, uh, even if we don't get through it. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns. What are diadems? Crowns. Crowns, ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. All right, so here is this beast. Now, let's establish right away, I think you already know this, but it's not a, it's not a literal beast, right? Don't expect that one day CNN is going to say, you have a special news bulletin, you know, we're down here at uh, Hudson River, climbing up on, onto Manhattan out of the water is this creature that has bare feet and, and uh, um, ten, seven heads and ten horns, right? It's not, it's not what it is. Um, I think just to give you a heads up, we're also not talking about a single individual literal person that fulfills this. So in the 
the pre-millennial scheme that we talked about early on in this course, they view this as a particular person, that someone's going to rise up, the, the head of the, the United Nations, or the head of a new coalition of mighty European armies, or the Pope, or any, that, that there's going to be one person who is like the Antichrist, the beast. And everybody is going. He's going to get everybody to worship him. It's not that, that either. Um, all right. So he rises up out of the sea. I had like ten verses that we could look at to get a sense of what that means. And we're not even going to look up any of them. How do you like that? Because we just have to move. But I've mentioned this before. In the Old Testament, what does the sea represent? What did they think about the sea? The Hebrews were not a seafaring people. I was in the Navy. I used to love to go out on the, uh, at the aft of the ship there and just look out at night in the water. So cool. He, he, ancient Hebrews, no way. They would never do that. They, they, didn't, go to, they didn't go to sea. Hell. Um, it, it was hell. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the bottom of the ocean, that was the place of the dead. Within the ocean were the monsters, the Leviathan, and the Rabat. The sea was the place of chaos. The sea was the place of evil. The sea was the place of darkness. That's one reason why when Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee and the storm rises up and he calms the storm, that means so much more to the original hearers than it would mean to us because he calmed the, these forces of chaos, all the things that are opposed to, to God, the sea. So the beast coming out of the sea, what does that tell you about the beast? It's, it, it's imagery to talk about its evil, it's, it's, its wickedness, it's how terrible it is. All right, it's got ten horns and seven heads. What are the seven heads? What do, what do the heads represent? Seven. 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 The seven deadly sins? No, no. Um, head. Think about heads. What what is a head? A leader. A, a, yeah. Head. Well, heads are heads are authority, right? The head of an organization is the or, the authority over that organization. So, so the heads are reflective of authority. And why would it have seven? What have we said is significant about the number seven? Perfection. Yeah, the, the number of perfection. Meaning, or. or, or completeness, full, 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 full fulfillment of all. Jesus, or, or excuse me, uh, God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. So seven is the way of saying it's all, this is it, this is the whole thing. So to have seven heads is to say this thing has like full authority. This is the whole measure of authority and invested in this beast. Um, what are the ten horns? What do horns represent most often in the scripture? Horns power. are power, right. And so it has ten horns. Um, and what did we say the number ten represents? Fullness. Yeah, it's, it's very similar in that respect to seven, but it, it represents the, the large, complete number. So how many commandments are there? Ten. How many plagues were there in Egypt? Ten, right? Having ten horns means this thing has full power. Um, and then the diadems on its horns. Um, what are what are the crowns or the diadems represent? Like being a king. Yeah, kings. Yeah. So right. I think that's it exactly. So these are these are. It's a way of. Looking at earthly authority, the crown was the symbol of earthly authority. So the the crown, the earthly authorities, where are they? They are on the the power of this beast. This beast's power is it, it comes from earthly authorities. Just look in your uh, text very quickly to previous chapter, Revelation twelve. Revelation twelve. Revelation 12, verse 3. So this was when we were introduced to the dragon. So in 12, verse 3, it says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads 
and ten horns. Oh, look at that. Who else had seven heads and ten horns? The dragon. So when the beast has seven heads and ten horns, what else is that telling you about the beast? It's a, it's a mimicry, a, a, a reflection of the dragon. And who did we say the dragon was? Satan, devil, devil, right? But the only difference here is that the dragon has, um, his diadems are on his head. The beast, his diadems are on the, the crowns. Or, uh, the, uh, excuse me, on the horns. Um, so that he's similar to the dragon, but the dragon's authority is, uh, is on the, the heads. The, the, the beast's authority is on the, the power in the horns. And it has, I'm on back in chapter 13, verse 1, um, and it has blasphemous names on its head. What is blasphemy? Well, we don't we don't think much about blasphemy anymore today, do we? Unacceptance of Christ would that, uh, that would be a it? that would be a blasphemy. I don't know if that we want to define it that way. Um, is similar to slander. Yeah, I think that's all true. I, I'm, I'm gonna go with Jim's. I think it's uh, anything that. Yeah, something sacrilegious, something that speaks ill or evil or disrespectfully about God would be blasphemy. So um, we don't think much about blasphemy. I, I've probably done this myself. I, you know, I'm, I'm ashamed to even think that I've done it. But how many times have you heard someone tell a joke about God? Um, and sometimes they're funny. But if, if the joke is, is diminishing God in some way, um, makes him look less than what he is, or doesn't show the sense of respect that we're supposed to show toward him, what we're actually doing is, is blaspheming. And uh, so blasphemy, you know, today not being green or, you know, or not being tolerant of transgenders, those are big sins. You know, blasphemy, we don't care about that, but blasphemy is a big a big deal. Um, verse 2, And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So let's look at a few um, other passages in Scripture to see some of the metaphors that, that uh, this vision is drawing upon. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7. So if you look at the, the, the bold print in front of Daniel chapter 7, you see there that this is Daniel's vision of the four beasts. We're not going to read the whole thing, but go to, go, just, just go to verse 17. What, I mean, what are the beasts, very quickly? Well, the first one, without reading it, well, all right, let's just do it. <laughs> go to chapter 7, verse 3. And four great beasts came up out of the sea. sea. Oh, where'd they come from? Place of evil, chaos, right? Verse 4, the first was like a lion with eagle's wings. Go to verse 5. Behold, another beast, the second one like a bear. Go to verse 6, another like a leopard. Verse 7, there's another one, a fourth beast that's all dreadful and terrible. Go to verse 17. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the, the earth. So Daniel tells us the beasts in his vision who they are. They're, they're earthly kings, earthly kingdoms. Um, who, who, who would those four kingdoms be? They're, not everybody is in full agreement, but in all likelihood... We're probably looking at um, Assyria. No, no, Babylon. I guess make sure I start this right. Babylon, Media, Persia, 
the Greeks under Alexander the Great, and then Rome would be the fourth, the fourth beast. So what were they from the time of Daniel? Those were the four great empires that that ruled the world successively, one after one after another. Okay, now we're back in Revelation 13, verse 2, and he, he's looking at one beast, but the beast has aspects of the metaphors from the beast in Daniel, right? It's got um, it's like a leopard, but it's got feet like the bear, it's got mouth like the like the lion. In other words, aspects of the other four beasts are all being incorporated into into this beast. So um, what is that telling us about this beast? The beast in John's vision here is a beast that reflects the same things that we saw in Babylon, Persia, Alexander the Great, and, and Rome. You mean like philosophies? Like who, who they worship? Uh, was it the yeah, same so she's thing? asking, like, in their philosophies or in, in who they worship. I think the answer is no. I think I think the similarities there are in that they are all great and mighty authorities and powers on earth that are in opposition to the things of God and the people of heaven. Okay. Um, so so you're starting to get a picture of seven, who the beast is. Who seven. Is, Seven groups that are, or peoples that are in opposition to God and the people of God. Is that yes. what you're talking about? Yes. Although it's not a literal number seven, right? Because the oh. seven we said is figurative. For, okay. So I think you know, years and years ago, I read was it Hal Lindsey or I don't know, and you know, they they saw it as the European Union, right? Oh. That you know, you had France and Germany, and he counts out seven, you know. And, and they all are going to combine and form this one great empire, and, but it's not—it's not a literal number of, of countries. It's—it's it's a way of describing the fullness of all civil authorities in the um, in the vein in which they represent antitheses to God and to His people. But let's look at that a little fuller for a moment. Um, go over to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17. So we were introduced to this beast in chapter 13, but the beast is going to reappear in chapter 17. So if we're trying to identify this beast, we can see some of the things that it says about it here in, in chapter 17. Let's start at... Uh, Let's start at verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. I'm talking about cryptic, right? It, it, it was, but it's not now, but it's coming back again. What, what on earth? What's it talking about there? Um, and the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Okay, so here he's identifying the seven heads on this beast as seven mountains. Now, anybody living in the ancient world who was told about a, a kingdom on seven mountains would instantly think of what? Rome. Rome. Rome is the city built on seven hills. It's famous for that. Um, so it's, it's a reference in some ways here to the Roman Empire. That the Roman Empire was in opposition to God and to his people. It's trying to make war on the people whose names have been written in the, in the book of life, right? Um, and yet, is it only the Roman Empire? Or is it the Roman Empire like a type or a shadow of it and there's going to be like a future Roman Empire someday? That's the real beast. No, I, I think it's incorporating, it's a way of describing all of these. So for John, 
in his time when this is being written, who, who is the most, who epitomizes the beast the most? Rome. Because they come in and they persecute the people. Right. But it's not, we should not look at it as, as only Rome. Let's, let's keep reading. I'm in chapter 17, uh, verse 10. So they are also, so we, the seven heads are seven mountains. What else are they? They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. So it's, a, it's another. You see how John is just using different metaphors and different imagery, and it's being mixed and matched and played with, and that's how, that's how this kind of literature works. If you start trying to get too close a correspondence, we want to, we want to figure it out. Oh, this means this, and that means that. And, and now you put it all together and it all fits. It, it just doesn't work that way. So you've got the seven hills, but now you also find out it's seven kings and five of them have already been and, and one is and one is not yet. Maybe I'm reaching, but uh, does that have anything to do with like the mortal wound that is healed? Oh, I want to come to that too. Okay. Um, so I'm glad you brought that up. Let's, let's read the next, next verse. Um, and as for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth. The how we find out there's an eighth king, right? <laughs> um, and it belongs to the seven, and it goes to uh, to destruction. Um, and what do we know about this beast? That it had these these seven heads, and one of the heads had a mortal wound, and the wound was healed. That's an oxymoron, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If it's a mortal wound, it doesn't recover; it dies. <laughs> Um, so, so it's clear that he, he he's mixing his his metaphors here. He he's, he's intentionally somewhat obscure because it's it's not designed to try to to make us draw attention to one particular thing that satisfies or fulfills what this this prophecy is all about. That to have it die and then come back relates to what we just read in chapter 17 about the one who is not and yet is to come. What is that telling us? It's telling us that the things that this beast reflects will sometimes look to us as if they've been overcome, as if they're, they're gone, as if they've died, and yet they keep coming back again and again and again. Um, all throughout the course of history, there are always going to arise um, authorities and rulers and those who, who possess power in the world who will use that authority and that power against God and against his people. And one might be destroyed and one is overcome and you think, thank God, that's done with. We're going to live in a better world now. And what's going to come back again? The same thing. This, that, 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 that's what's happening here with this, with this beast. Um, I'm out, now I'm back in chapter 13, verse 3. Um, the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So everyone who looks at this beast, this, this earthly authority that has received its authority from the dragon, what do they do? They marvel at it. Um, and they worship the dragon. So what does the beast cause people to do? Causes them to worship the, the devil. Uh, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast. So what else do they do, those who are under the control of this authority? They worship the beast too, saying, who is like the beast and who can, can fight against it? Why? Because he, he, he keeps coming back again, because he keeps having such great power. So when people look at the government, whether it was ancient Babylon, or whether it was ancient Rome, or whether it was Joseph Stalin, um, or whether it was Adolf Hitler, 
uh, when people look at governments and say, ah, oh, this is so great what they're able to do. It's so amazing what they can accomplish. They're so powerful. Who could fight against them? Who can withstand them? That is all part of what's caught up in this vision of the, the beast. That that is what happens with the, the thing to which the devil has given, given his authority. Um, and it's recurring. It happens over time again and again and again. Let's look up 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. You mean First John? First John, First John, the Epistle of John, not the Gospel. First John two. First John two. And let's take a look at verse eighteen. First John two, verse eighteen. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. So this idea that one day there's going to be the Antichrist, whether you think it's going to be the head of the European coalition or the Pope or whatever, the idea that there's going to be the Antichrist someday, what does the scripture actually teach? That there are many antichrists, that there are many throughout the course of all time who are characterized by being in complete opposition to Christ. They are antichrists, and they will continue to recur over time. So that's what we're that's what we're looking at here. Um, so you know, it's interesting in the book of Romans we have a perspective on our relationship to civil authority. Who appointed Caesar? Who, who gave power to Caesar, according to Paul in the book of Romans? God, God, did. God did, right. There's no authority but from God. So God allows him to receive the authority. John is giving us another look at it. Saying, oh, that, it's not saying that's not true, but he's saying, from another perspective, who has given Caesar his authority? The, the dragon. And so all the things that Caesar did to harm Christians and to combat the church, who was behind that? The, the devil. And the same thing is true in our day and age too, right? So we respect governing authority. You know, I say the Pledge of Allegiance and I stand up for the, the national anthem and I love my my country, but who, who is also at work in the powers that be in our country um, in certain veins, in certain ways, when and wherever they can to, to harm Christians, to harm the faith, to combat Christ? The, the devil's behind a lot of it, too. We, we've, we've, got to, we've got to be able to see that. Let's go to chapter 13 again, Revelation 13. Pick up again at verse 5. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. So what characterizes the beast? Blasphemous. Bla bla speaking against God. You know, I hate to put I hate to put this on any individual because I, I know that's gonna work against the, the, the what I'm trying to make you see here, but when you get, for example, the governor of one of our states who's battling the COVID virus and has a little success and stands up and says, God didn't do this, we did this. God, God, one of our governors said that. Did you know that? No, I didn't know. Um, isn't that uttering blasphemy? Isn't that the power of the authority of the state um, speaking against God? Um, and it, it happens throughout all time, right? Um, but then look at the second half of that verse. It was allowed to exercise authority 
for 42 months. So even though it's blasphemous and it's working against God, what, what do we need to know behind it? It's being allowed to do this. Who's allowing it? God. God, right. So now you see how Paul's perspective and Romans and John's perspective here in Revelation fit together. That you can say with John here, the, 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 the authorities and the powers that are opposed to God receive their power from the devil. And yet Paul is right too because they're being allowed to do it. Who gives them final authority at the same time to exist? God, God does. Um, verse 6, it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who, who dwell in heaven. So, um, what are the different ways in which it blasphemes? It blasphemes when it speaks directly against God. It blasphemes when it speaks against the dwelling of God or what God has established. And it blasphemes when it speaks against those who dwell in heaven. Now when it says those who dwell in heaven, I don't know that we're 100% sure um, what that is. Like against angels because they dwell in heaven, that, that doesn't make much sense. And I, I haven't heard many blasphemies, blasphemies against them. You heard any people like blaspheming angels? I guess they could. Um, that could be a way of describing who are those that dwell, on, dwell in heaven, those whose names have been written in the book of life, which we're going to read about. Your dwelling place, your home, is in heaven. So it could be a way of describing you. So when people blaspheme you, when they say, oh, those, those lousy Christians, you know, they're a bunch of backwards people and they're stupid and they don't, they, they're intolerant because they're against this and they're against people who want to just exercise their sexual freedoms. And when they're blaspheming you, who are they blaspheming? God. God. Um, there's more scriptures here we could look up, but I think I'm going to skip them. Um, let's go to verse 7. Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. So where is the country in the world? We've got 200, 269 countries or whatever. I used to know something like that. Um, which one of those is the, the country that follows the Bible? Which one of those is the country that really is a true Christian country? That their God is fully honored and God is, God is exalted as Lord and um, everything in the way the country is run perfectly reflects um, the way God wants things to be run. Which, which country is that? Not yeah, I see heads shaking. Right, there's not one like. There's never going to be a country like. That. There's never going to be. Why? Because every authority, every nation, every language, in some respect, is, is getting its authority from the, the dragon. Every every country is going to, in some respect, be pushing back against the things of uh, of God. And so th what does this beast do? He's making war on the saints. Now you can see that more clearly in some places and in some times in history than you can in, in others. So right now in the United States, I think it's worse than any time I can see in the history of the United States as I read our history. But we're still way better than many countries in the world, right? Um, did anybody sign up for that Voices of the Martyr magazine? You, I, I'd encourage you to do this. Just go onto their website, Voices, Voice of the Martyrs, and they have a little magazine, and they'll send it to you for free. And all it does is just, uh, they, and they are going to ask for money, right? You know, <laughs> of course they're going to ask you for money. But um, they, they have in their magazine stories of people in various places in the world um, that are going through persecution because they're Christians. 
So I bring this up with Christians and I, I see sometimes I can look in their faces and they don't know what I'm talking about because I've been reading this magazine for um, decades now already. I've, been, I've had it for, for many, many years. I, I'm just accustomed to this, that every week there's a girl, a Christian girl in Pakistan who gets acid thrown in her face because she's a Christian. And there's a young pastor in, um, in Vietnam or Burma who's been thrown into a big pit and his family doesn't know if he's alive or dead because they can't visit him. I, I, this stuff is happening all around the world all the time. So our Christian brothers and sisters, people that you have more in common with them because you share the same faith than you do with your your physical family members who are not Christian. You know that, right? You have more in common with your spiritual brothers and sisters. Um, this is the stuff they're going through in the, in the world. Why? Because the beast is making war on them. Whether the beast is um, somebody in Pakistan or somebody in communist China or somebody at Boko Haram, Boko Haram in Nigeria, Whatever, whatever these authorities and powers are, they're using their power to make war on the saints. That, and that's, that's us, my brothers and sisters. Um, verse 8, And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Will worship what? The devil. The, the beast. The beast, right. Yeah. Everyone, everyone who dwells on earth is going to worship it. Everybody worships the beast. Except for those, except everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So the imagery there is that there's a book. There's actually, I, I've got more verses too. We're not going to look them up. But there are other passages in the Bible where there's this imagery of a book. That God has a book. It's kind of like Santa Claus is naughty and nice, right? But God, God has a book. And every person who is going to be saved, every person who belongs to the Lamb, their name is in the, the book. And so every person whose name is not in the book, who ultimately do they worship? The beast. So does this mean that they literally, will they set up like the church to the beast? <laughs> do they have like a beast with, that looks like a lemon with, or a lemon, a, a, a leopard <laughs> with a, bear paws and lion's teeth and they set up an image of it in front of a building and people come and sing hymns to it. it it's, it's, that's not what it's describing. It's, but it's, it is saying there's this great, huge dichotomy among people. You either worship the Lamb. If you don't worship the Lamb, you are, by the way you live your life and the way you talk and the things you do, you are worshiping the beast. You're giving glory and honor to the thing that is in, uh, the Antichrist, the thing that's set up against God. There's no middle ground. There's no neutrality. There's no gray. Everybody either worships the lamb or they worship the beast. There's an interesting thing to note about this passage in verse 8. The way it's written here, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the, the lamb who was slain, um, the, the grammar there can be read a different way. And so I think I don't go along with the way the ESV translates it here. I would go with other ways. And um, I, I feel safe that, uh, I don't know if Martin Luther ever weighed in on this, I'm just not sure, but I do feel safe that the uh, Concordia commentary series sees it the way I do. So I know I'm not way out in that field. But you could also read that to be everyone's name who was not written in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. How is that different? There's still a book, and your name is written in the book, but the book belongs to the Lamb, and what do we know about the Lamb? When was he slain? Not in 33 A.D. Is he was slain from the foundation of the world. Oh. It's it's a it's a it's a proleptic way of saying that it was God's plan for Christ to be crucified. 
and for you to be saved through faith, through faith in Christ and His death on the cross, when did that plan arise? At the beginning. At the beginning. God saw the whole way this was going. To, so as bad as it gets, if, there, if the beast is making war on you and your life really stinks, um, remember, God saw this whole thing right from the beginning. This is not, he, God is not calling audibles at the line of scrimmage. He's saying, oh, oh, this is a different lineup than I expected. Let's do this. This is all happening the way he, he planned it. Um, verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Um, let's go back again to chapter 12 for a moment. Chapter 12. So remember in chapter 12, it's the dragon making war against, um, against the woman and against the, the children of the woman. Um, and the woman, the church, look in verse uh, 14. The woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. Um, there, there's other passages that we've read in other places here in Revelation where it talks about the protection that God is going to give. So God is going to protect the woman, bring her to a place of safety, God is going to protect the church. But when it says that we're going to be protected and taken care of, what does that mean? Does that mean that the evil things that the beast is trying to bring about will not happen to you? No. Now back in chapter 13, verse 9, the last verse I read there, if someone's going to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. And if someone's going to be slain by the sword, with the sword must he be slain. In other words, the promises that we're reading here in Revelation are not promises that you won't suffer martyrdom. They're not promises that you won't be put in prison for your faith. They're not promises that bad things will never happen to you. They're promises that in the midst of those things, in spite of those things, God is protecting and keeping your faith. So the last verse of, or the last sentence of verse 10, chapter 13, verse 10. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Um, so the theme there is that there is going to be suffering for your, for your faith. You should expect that. We, we should not be surprised. As much as I pray that it doesn't happen to our country, we should not be surprised if a year from now they make a law and say, if, if you don't accept gay marriage in your church, we're taking away your nonprofit status and uh, we're going to do this to you and you're going to do We should not be surprised if that happens. But what, what we should count on is that in the midst of the persecution, in the midst of the struggles, God is going to protect our faith to make sure that we endure. And we're, we're going to see as we go through the book of Revelation, the outcome of those who worship the beast and the outcome of those who worship the land, those are going to be two very different things. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's end there. And next week, we'll look at the second beast and what that's describing for us, okay? All right, thanks, everybody. Thanks for bearing with me. I know sometimes I probably get tongue tied and I'm not explaining this as well as this could be, but I hope you're getting a sense of it of what these things are.